I think it's time to start the next session. Uh, we're looking forward to hear from Astrid Weyer Sanchez from Unicure Therapeutics in the Netherlands. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you so much for the opportunity and to all of you for being here. So today uh, I'll talk a little bit about gene therapy and uh, different aspects that it takes to develop it. Um, but first, a little bit about myself, just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm originally from Barcelona, and uh, life and studies brought me all the way to Holland, where I'm now. Um, I have a preclinical biology uh, background, uh, neuroscience, and in, since 2016, I'm at Unicure. It's a biotech company uh, where I started working on Huntington's disease right from the start in biomarkers, and now I'm supporting the early programs, not uh, Huntington's uh, so much, only on the site, but many CNS disease uh, uh, programs. Um, this is my family. I love being outside, and uh, I love traveling, so I love meeting you, uh, all of you here in Glasgow. So Unicure started actually uh, as a spin-off of a group in the uh, Amsterdam Medical Center. Um, this is one of the first barracks where we did the first research a long time ago. Uh, and we grew with time. Um, in 2012, we changed our name to Unicure, but all our products uh, honor the, the first name of the company and are called AMT and then a number. Uh, we have celebrated across the years the different milestones. So we had the first gene therapy approved in the EU in 2012. We started dosing the first 80 patients with the gene therapy in 2020. And uh, late last year, and beginning of years, this year, we celebrated the approval of the first gene therapy for hemophilia B, both in the US and in Europe. These are our premises in Amsterdam. We also have premises in Lexington and, and shortly uh, as well in, in Basel. Uh, our gene therapies are focused to CNS and liver disorders. As mentioned, hemophilia B, the most advanced, and the second most advanced is our gene therapy for Huntington's disease. So uh, our patient advocacy team, led by uh, Dan Leonard and Edgar uh, Vega here as well, you can uh, contact them uh, in our booths if you want there, leading the engagement with the patient community in general of the indications that we work with, and the HD community in particular, through different uh, um, interaction uh, uh, organ uh, that we organize. We invite patient speakers over, patient advocates. This is uh, last year in Lexington, where uh, they speak to uh, our employees and allow the interaction between us. We also uh, have participated in different ad boards. This is last year in Bologna, where we had a uh, very good interaction uh, uh, back then. And this is earlier this year in Amsterdam, where we organized a patient day, and we had the Dutch uh, Huntington's disease community coming over to visit the labs, uh, to ask questions, and to interact as, as well with with our employees. We believe that this is key for our programs to hear the voice of the patient and to shape our, uh, our programs uh, moving forward and uh, doing it in the right way um, as much as we can. So yeah, this is our mission. And again, here, Jessie, uh, patient advocate as well, you may know. Uh, she has been at Lexington as well. She also participated in the last ad board last summer. And our mission is to deliver treatments to patients that are one-time treatments. So it's a one-time administration, which um, is uh, hopefully aimed to be uh, transformat uh, transformating. A big back to basic biology uh, again, uh, and thank you to the previous speaker for introducing some of these terms. So you all know our uh, most of our cells contain 46 chromosomes made of DNA, and this DNA barcode and these genes determine many of our characteristics. Color of our skin, how tall we are, color of our eyes, uh, our IQ uh, capabilities, but also the propensity to health and disease. Because uh, the more we know about the DNA code and how it encodes the different RNAs and proteins in our cells, the more we uh, can also know that certain mutations in this code uh, can lead to disease or can increase the propensity to certain diseases. And I explain that because actually this information is at the core of gene therapy. 
gene therapy use uh, the, what we know about the genetic components linked to disease to develop strategies behind uh, the approaches uh, for our uh, therapeutic indications. Yes, the recipe again. So uh, uh, I think this is a great analogy as well in the field of gene therapy, which is actually a technique that uses genetic material, this recipe, to treat or prevent disease. And this would be the basic components of, generally speaking, a gene therapy, so we have a DNA expression cassette, which is actually the recipe encoding for a certain protein or therapeutic molecule, biological. But this recipe needs to be delivered to your cells and to the right organs um, as specifically as possible. So we use different vectors, we call them therapeutic vectors, that you can compare to these different envelopes, different type of boxes, different type of envelopes that are actually tailored depending on the organ that you need to reach or the cell type that you need to reach. It's important to bring these instructions and this box to the right organ and for this we use different delivery methods, different methods of transport, depending again on the indication that we're working in. But uh, bottom line is that by doing this uh, at the basis of gene therapy, what you aim is that the organ that is affected in a certain disease would be actually the uh, factory of the therapeutic molecule and by a single administration in the right organ, in the right cells, this will allow the continuous production of the therapeutic molecule to correct or partly correct uh, um, these uh, mutations or the downstream effects of these mutations. So gene therapy is a very general term, but there are many nuances, different types of gene therapy which we can classify depending on which type of recipe we use, what we call the different therapeutic modalities, but also which kind of envelope or boxes we use, which kind of vectors we use to bring it to the right cells, and also which delivery methods, which methods of transport do we use to bring this recipe in this container into the right place. So when talking about therapeutic modalities, there are very different ones, but these are the main ones that are being developed in the, developed in the field of gene therapy. We have gene regulation approaches, you know, that depending on a mutation, you can have too much production of a protein or too little production of a protein, and the gene regulation aims to adjust that. So to reduce uh, the amount of protein when you have too much, or to in increase the amount of protein when you have too little of it. With gene transfer, like for instance, what we have developed for the hemophilia B, in, in, there is one protein that is highly expressed, and then it affects the clotting cascade. Um, basically, we transfer the gene that encodes for this protein that is missing in, in uh, using the gene therapy approaches. And finally, this is much more innovative, and I think there was a previous question related to that, that also approaches that are quite early but uh, developing very fast in, in gene editing, which are aimed to correct directly the mutations at the level of the DNA of the patient. In terms of vectors of envelopes that we use, there are also very different types of. Uh, you can use lipid nanoparticles, which is sort of a membrane that envelops the DNA, the recipe. Also plasmids have been used. But many companies use uh, modified viruses that are in the nature that can be engineered and modified so that they become this box, this container, to deliver the recipe to the right place. And there are different types of viruses, uh, adeno-associated viruses, AAVs, or for instance, lentiviruses that can be used. And finally, we can talk about gene therapies that are directly delivered to the patients through different uh, administration procedures but also there are gene therapies that uh, are used by extracting the uh, cells from the patients, treating them with a the gene therapy, and then when these cells are treated, they're brought back to the patients, sort of corrected cells. So lots of different flavors in gene therapy, uh, and that's why at UNIQ we focus on basically gene regulation processes, gene transfer therapeutic modalities, and we use AAVs or adeno-associated viruses to deliver these, um, these instructions to the right uh, cells and to the right organs by direct uh, delivery, delivery to the patients. And because of that, I'm just going to focus on this type of gene therapy today because it's too much to cover it all. So 
gene therapy might sound like science fiction, maybe, uh, for some of you, maybe not. But it's been around for quite some time. And actually, the type of gene therapy that I'm talking today, the AVs, uh, these viruses that we use as a basis for our gene therapy, were discovered more than 50 years ago. Uh, and they, you know, researchers in the field, uh, because this virus had certain properties, it was not very pathogenic at all. Actually, it needed another virus in order to be pathogenic. They thought, actually, it's very cool if we try to modify it to bring this recipe for gene transfer. Uh, and the field developed in, uh, in a way that um, almost three years ago, or actually 30 years ago, there was a first proof that it was possible to do gene transfer using AV in vivo, using preclinical models. This led to the first gene, ther gene therapy trial, in this case for cystic fibrosis, in 1996. Um, and a lot of teams, a lot of groups working in making better AVs, the, uh, discovering that there are many different flavors of AVs, different types of boxes, different types of envelopes that you can use, and um, also different groups uh, finding out how to make this biologic, how to produce it in a reproducible manner. Um, this led in 2012 to indeed the first gene therapy product approved in Europe, 217, the first one in the US, and now we have as many as five gene therapy products approved in the US and six in Europe, um, and counting up. Uh, I was happy that I was able to share this slide just to illustrate how much is going on in the field. So the gene therapy landscape is huge, uh, and it's being developed for, developed for different therapeutic indications. So not only hematology or metabolic diseases, uh, but also oncology, eye, uh, cardiovascular, and for the interest of today, a lot going on in the brain space and CNS space. If you are interested in these slides, uh, um, I can uh, share it with you or share the contact person that shared it with me. He was happy that uh, for me to do that. Um, so a lot going on in the space, and not only from biotech companies like ours, but also from large pharma that is focusing on gene therapy. So what does it take to develop a gene therapy product? Um, it takes quite a lot of work, quite a lot of research. And I think that we can sort of divide it in four main pillars. So how to choose the gene, how to write this recipe, which kind of box or envelope are you going to use, how are you going to make this, and how are you going to deliver it to patients. And I'm just going to give some examples of uh, each of these four pillars. So the recipe, the DNA sequence, you choose this based on what's known on the molecular pathophysiology of the disease. In the case of Huntington's disease, we know that the um, CAG expansion in the Huntington gene is at the core of the downstream uh, pathophysiology of the disease, and that's why many companies focus on the Huntington protein and, uh, and the ways of modulating the expression of this protein for disease modification. And um, uh, for gene therapy, this is also some of the approaches that have been used, expressing a recipe, writing a recipe that would downstream cause, uh, for instance, reduction of the Huntington protein um, in, the, in the right uh, cells that are affected in the disease. Next, how to use the right box, how to use the right AV flavor, how to use the right maybe envelope, not a box. So as I mentioned, there are different types of AVs. They're numbered very simple, one, two, three, four, five, six, but uh, there are also many groups that are, are engineering AVs uh, in a way, you know, to modify the way that they can reach specific cells or specific regions in a specific organ. This is just one example of one type of AV, AB5, which actually encodes for a recipe that will make that uh, the cells that have been targeted with this AV5 express a green protein that you can see under the microscope. And this is just an example of a section of a, a mouse brain, which you, you can see in red, where the AVs, which cells they have reached, you can see that in red. And then downstream of that, using the recipe, these cells are able to express a green protein. <laughs> and you see that with these yellow dots that you see uh, together with the red cells, but also 
in this case, these are neurons that are being targeted, and the neur neurons have certain proje projections, and this green protein can also be expressed in these projections. So these tell us that this type of uh, vector, this type of package, is good to target neurons in this case, and to have neurons express a certain therapeutic molecule or a certain molecule. How to produce the gene therapies? And it's, this is a whole wall in itself. Um, this is a biologic. And um, at the end of the road, when we want to bring it to patients, you need to be able to produce this molecule in a consistent manner, with enough quality, always in the same way, so that you always have the same product. And a lot of work is done to be able to do that. And you see how this is also developing depending on the stage of discovery where we are. We typically start with a small scale production, so two liters tank bio uh, steel tank bioreactors, and then scaling up to 50 liter, 500 liter, 1,000 liter, up to 10,000, in order to be able to have a scalable uh, process to produce this gene therapy in, uh, in the right uh, amounts. Finally, the delivery. So uh, for brain disorders, depending on the brain areas affected, there are different delivery methods that are, are used in the field of gene therapy. In the case of Huntington's disease, because the first regions that are affected are very deep in the brain, with the AV types, with the uh, boxes, envelope types that we have, the most efficient way to deliver these into the affected regions is by a procedure that directly administers the gene therapy into the affected region. And this is an example, again, again with the same uh, analogy. This is uh, the box that expresses, uh, that brings up this green fluorescent protein, which is here brown. Sorry about that. But everything that you see brown is a green fluorescent protein, which has been stained with a, a brown staining. And you can see that when we bring the, this uh, AV local in the putamen in this case, depending on the conditions of the delivery, the volume that we administer, the dose that we administer, you can have the expression of the therapeutic molecule not only in the place where you bring it, but also in other brain regions that are connected with these initial, initial brain regions. And we make use of that in order to make it possible. This is just an example of, of how to do that and how we visualize it in a, in a brain, in this case, uh, of a large animal. So I talk about the different pillars, but uh, there are several challenges that we try to address. Uh, and uh, these challenges are the translational sh challenges. So how to go from the patient to a preclinical studies and then back again. And what we try to do in the field is use as many models as possible, because there is not a perfect model. As mentioned as well for the, by the previous speaker, mouse models just recapitulate part of the disease, but not all. So we need to try to use as much knowledge as possible, as many different models as possible, to build up evidence that the gene therapies that are uh, developed for a certain indication are going to be safe and efficacious. And one of the models that are actually very important, not only for Huntington's, but for any other, many other indications, is to be able to use patient cells for in vitro studies. These patient cells are very important not only to reduce the development time, but also to reduce the number of animals that we need for a preclinical pre package. And finally, but actually most importantly, to be able to assess any safety concerns or any efficacy concerns in the context of a human situation, a patient situation. This is how this is done. So basically, uh, skin cells can be obtained from the patient. And these skin cells can be differentiated back to an undifferentiated state. We call them induced pluripotent stem cells, which then, depending on different cocktails of molecules that we use, can be differentiated back into another cell type, for instance, brain cells, but also into clumps of cells that then become organoids or mini brains and can be used to answer certain questions. And this is just an example, again, back to the GFP of how we can use these models to bring our vectors and study what they do. This is what we did uh, in the context of our gene therapy trials, so uh, using as, ma as many uh, models as possible to build up the package that would support the start of the clinical studies, which are now ongoing, uh, both in the US and in, and in Europe. 
And um, yeah, this is what I wanted to tell you. This is uh, uh, our team in Amsterdam celebrating uh, the HMB approval. Lots of different people of different backgrounds, but all of us with the same goal, which is bring, bringing gene therapies to patients. So thanks for your attention and I'll answer any questions that you may have. Questions from the audience? Hi. Um, so when we were talking about RNA in the last session, we were kind of talking about like, oh, if you took too much, you would just kind of come off the drug and yeah. then, you know, go back. Yeah. How does that work with gene therapy or does it? Yes. Um, good question. So it depends. There are gene therapies where uh, you cannot modulate how much you do it. That's why it's so important to build this preclinical package in a way that you know exactly which is the right dose that we need to use, the right delivery method, in order for it not to become too much. Next to this, typically the gene therapy trials are very small and very slow because, uh, you know, bringing the gene therapy once and forever has the good parts but also the risks associated to it. And we, are, we and the regulators are very aware of that. So we need to build up it very slowly uh, in order to ensure that it would never be too much. There are different tools in the field as well that are moving forward that would allow us with certain small molecules on top of the gene therapy to regulate the expression. And this is a very exciting field that is also <laughs> developing. Um, and as well in the recipe, you can use uh, what we call promoters. It's also a piece of DNA which is responsible of uh, saying how much of this recipe are you going to read. And uh, playing around with these promoters is actually key. So I didn't go into this, but there is a lot of work before you go into the patients to look at which is the right promoter that is going to give you the right level of expression of your therapeutic molecule because it's very important to hit it right. And um, that's why, you know, it needs to be done so carefully. Yeah. More questions? Hi. Um, do you have any insight on when the treatment should be given? If it's supposed to be a one-off treatment, um, you know, at what point do you give patients the treatment as early as possible? Or maybe you could give some insight into that. Good question. So I'll try to answer these as generally as possible. Um, there is a lot ongoing in the field to know, uh, to try to find this question. Um, I think generally speaking, uh, most specialists in the field would agree that in principle as early as possible would be desirable. Um, but of course, you need to make sure that the therapeutic molecule that you are administering doesn't have any risks when you administer it at, as early as possible. And that's why many of these gene therapy trials are built uh, from a place where the patients that are treated are maybe showing already some symptoms, just uh, to know about things, whether the therapy is going to be efficacious and also whether it's safe. And then the hope is that we can move back from there uh, in order to be able to treat patients early on. But again, here it's a stepwise process where we need to be, go very slowly. Anyone else? Um, how, how do you get these molecules? I know you were like explaining like you use this virus, but can you explain the process of using that to it actually getting into like a human brain? Like, are you doing like lumbar punctures? Is it a pill you take? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm also going to answer this in a general fashion. Uh, so what's done in the field of gene therapy for uh, CNS disorders. Um, many flavors here as well, and this depends on the indication and on the sort of a type of AV that you use. Uh, with the AVs that have been shown to be safe uh, at this moment on time, when you need to reach deep brain regions, uh, like in the case of Huntington's disease, the most effective way is do a, a procedure with a direct administration in the, in the brain region affected. This would be the most effective way. 
but there are a lot of developments in the field of gene therapy trying to modify these capsids in a way that we would be able to give it in a less invasive uh, way. And uh, lots of groups are working on that, although for the time being, we are at the preclinical stage. There are other CNS indications uh, where maybe the brain regions affected are more superficial and close to the CSF, or for instance, are the spinal cord, like for instance in ALS. And for these indications, it's efficient enough to give a lumbar puncture, a single lumbar puncture. Um, there are different methods that are developed, like special catheters that are used to, for instance, uh, bring the AV across the, the whole um, uh, spinal cord. So it's a catheter that's done via lumbar puncture, and then it, it moves uh, throughout the spinal cord. And this is, has been shown to be efficacious enough to reach the spinal cord. So it will depend very much on the brain regions that are affected, how you're going to deliver it. Um, but the field, as I mentioned, is moving forward. We also have one team that is working on new AVs and new capsids to hopefully be able in the future to have capsids that ideally would be administered intravenously and reach the brain. That's what we all wish for, and uh, many people across the world are working on that, but we're not there yet. More questions? Um, uh, gene therapy, uh, uh, single strand RNA in, in HIV uh, virus, it will um, um, reproduce in the cell, but the uh, single strand RNA, it's a short time. Uh, live so it will um it's always replicate and and will destroy um good question um and i realize i don't have a good uh, slide to explain that but basically in the type of gene therapy that we are using uh in the basic biology slide when i was talking about the chromosomes that we have in our cell that are encoding for our dna Actually, what we do with our genes uh, therapy, bringing this recipe, this recipe stays in the cell forever. And especially in the case of neurons, which do not replicate anymore, they're called postmitotic cells, they stay there, you have this, the number stays stable, let's say. Um, this recipe stays there forever, like an extra chromosome. We call it episome, because it's not a chromosome, we call it episome. It's not integrating in the chromosome that you have. It's staying there like an extra mini chromosome and always there for the machinery of the cell to read the recipe. And that's why it's possible to give it only once because this recipe book stays there in the cell forever, especially in the brain. But in the case of hemophilia, where actually you need to target the liver and the liver cells are also dividing We've been able to see that our gene therapy is there for many, many, many years uh, through mechanisms uh, that the field starts to, uh, to understand. So these episomes, these mini chromosomes, st stay there for many, many years. That's uh, what we can say from what we know. Does it answer your question? No. Then uh, come to me uh, maybe later on. I'll try to answer it better. Yeah. Sorry. Can you explain uh, what biomarkers you're using, and can you explain what a biomarker is? Sure. Yeah. So there are many experts here, uh, maybe not in this audience, but I think in this conference that uh, would be able to explain it uh, even better. But a, bi a biomarker is actually a measure that is used in, um, in the patient for different purposes. Uh, for drug development, the purpose is to be able to find out whether the therapy is safe and also whether the therapy is going to be efficacious. And this is, there are also biomarkers that are used to be able to know whether a patient will be eligible for, for a therapy or not. So basically these are measures that you can do in the patient. You can do brain scans, you can take blood and measure some molecules in the blood 
also CSF, to be able to give you this kind of information. And this is crucial in drug development because you want to be able, you know, to say in advance whether a patient is going to be benefiting for the therapy or not, or maybe when we go into, into the future into more uh, therapies that are more tailored to a specific uh, patient population, you'll be able to say this therapy is good for you, this therapy is not good for you. Uh, biomarkers are used for this purpose as well. Um, and it's crucial that we learn more about the relationship of these biomarkers with the disease because we basically can't monitor whether the therapy is going to be uh, safe and efficacious early enough. So that was a good definition of biomarker, but which biomarkers are you all using? For our gene therapy, um, we use different biomarkers. Uh, if you talk about the gene therapy that is going to be uh, targeting Huntington and lowering the levels of Huntington, um, we try to follow um, actually what we call the mechanism of action of the drugs. So we know that we deliver the box, that this box encodes for a piece of DNA, which then encodes for a molecule and have a downstream effect. So we try to follow all these steps. That's a, the ideal situation. But because generally for gene therapy for CNS disorders, you administer the gene therapy in the brain, you do the readouts in a surrogate, uh, um, in a surrogate uh, matrix, uh, so for instance in the CSF or in the blood, hoping that this is going to correlate with what's going on in the brain. So basically for a gene therapy, we would aim to measure the recipe because you want to know if the recipe is there and you want to know the effects of the recipes. So in this case, whether Huntington is lowered, so we would measure also Huntington. But we would measure also markers, safety markers. Uh, you probably have heard a lot about NFL, which correlates really well with the disease, but can also tell you whether your therapy is, is safe and the reaction to the therapy. Um, imaging measure, measures are also important when there is neurodegeneration in certain brain regions. Uh, MRIs, so scans, are also used to follow that. So we use what we call a panel of biomarkers, so different ones that will tell you different aspects. <laughs> Thanks. We are running out of time. Thank you very much for all your questions. Yes. Thank you for your questions, questions, and please uh, reach me if you want to know anything.